design and it's there to be in every inspection we measure the values yeah. and make sure they don't go below a certain value. How many That's channels? It's about 11 but we use 9 actively. So basically behind there, you can't really see it, but there is a unit called ZLG. It's a uh, control center. It's like the black pedal blue box which gives, takes the demands from the driver's pedal and gets the feedback from the motor, how many RPMs and how much temperature and stuff like that. Oh, okay. This is like the health center and it delegates various other modules what to do. And that's what we always do. All these modules have access here. This is from the roof for the propulsion. This is the set that I just talked about. And these three are mounted in the box upstairs. Okay. All of this is a wire extension. That means I can go in here with my laptop and take a download of events. And get all that data. And look wow. at the data, sift through it and say, okay, well, you've got a bad module, a bad contactor, yeah. or the motor's on its way out. And you can find it from here without having to go dig around. You can, for okay. the most part, see a lot from here. Then you go upstairs, and then you have various more features in your laptop functions with manual switching. You can actually switch things and watch little lights go on and off. Oh. So, is it really working? Because especially intermittent, it's very pesky. Yeah. Hey, it's working. What are you talking about? No, but not when you take notes for three hours, right? <laughs> So anyways, you can double check things by manually switching and see lights go on and off at the IGBD driver board, for example. If there is nothing obviously blown up, you're going to make additional measurements, like for example, we have fiber optics. It's going to be phased out, but right now all these buses have fiber optics, hmm. just for the propulsion side, yeah. in order for noise immunity and additional insulation. But the problem is fiber optics, as we were told from Germany, is they're starting to wear out. Uh, You're degrading the light, light the LEDs are degrade, degrading. Yeah. From what used to be 120 microwatts, let's say, which is nice and bright, we see as low as 20 microwatts only. And they cannot just can change the emitter receiver and keep the fibers? Well, we are trying to maybe replace, but the problem is they're no longer available. There's obsolete parts now, right? That sounds so counterintuitive. Sounds like yeah. fiber optics would be the way to go for the future. I know, yeah, I, know I know, I know. They're going back away from it now. Interesting. They actually have going back to uh, directly connected wires, right? Oh, huh. yeah. can bus now. It's all can I mean, bus. it's, it, it's more bus, reliable yeah. on the data. Yeah. Have so yes, we didn't have much breakage, but the other thing is with connections too, is when the buses get older and people walk along the roof and touch things a lot, you could have the fiber optic cable shift a little bit, and it makes a huge difference in uh, intensity. The slightest movement I see drops from 120 down to 60. It still works at 40, but in the middle, you now you add some melt, it gets even worse. It's a compound effect. So we automatically have a reject level if you see something at only 40. How does the transmission of the temperature works? You said when they drive into the yard at night, they transmit uh, temperature data, and you can actually is that wireless, or do they have well, to? Does somebody have to come to inside and download it? No. What happens is uh, we have a, a corn core EDU vehicle data unit installed on each bus. It's a separate little black box from a different company. And they were initially there in all our buses, also diesel buses. And they're just for one purpose, is to transmit the number of kilometers traveled each day. Wirelessly. When you come to the fueling station, that transmit, it transmits that data to the number of liters dispensed. Huh. So you have an idea fleet weight, how much fuel each bus uses for certain runs. Nice. It's called a fuel data capture system. Mm -hmm. Presumably but that's the bottom line for a lot of people. That's the bottom line, yeah. yeah. This got expanded upon. That little transmitter, which picks up not just the bus number, because it has its own ID, bus number, and the kilometers traveled, has additional inputs available, which got programmed for our purpose. Two, and, and, and we just added it a few years ago, eight additional inputs, which is the EPU battery temperature. So temperature sensor mounted directly on the EPU battery, yeah. which gets transmitted, of course, to the ZLG. And that guy transmits that data to the VDU and can network. Oh, okay. So, so you can, you can read that from there. From so, the so the VDU connected to CAN bus will pick out the data for temperature, the EPU, 
the ambient temperature, which is actually in the housing upstairs, but it gives you an idea, was it a really hot day, that's why the EPU was hot, or was the EPU hot because of excessive yeah. kilometers traveled, oh, which right. you can see too. Yeah, right? Right. It has the number of timeouts, like an EPU cycle too, remember we talked about it earlier? It gives me a count of and how many times this thing timed out. Mm. There's a direct correlation between weak battery and number of timeouts. Yeah, lots yeah. of timeouts, you know your not battery is sick. Not heat, interestingly. There's uh -huh. no correlation between the number of timeouts and heat. Interesting. I have seen low timeouts and yet heat problems. And I have seen weak battery capacity and no heat problems. Yeah. But we correlate much more number of timeouts to capacity problems. That guy is most likely to come back with a problem. Yeah. So those number of timeouts we collect on a monthly basis. We have a hierarchy of buses to look at next and plan our replacement over the next few years. So I have buses for 2017 lined up, for 2018, all the ones which come next. Yeah, fair. Just based on the number of timeouts. No, it makes sense. And of course, there's strip weird things happening. Maybe one goes totally beyond, uh, goes bad anyway. But that's yeah. the unknown, right? Yeah. And then we have the number of dewirements. If you dewire a lot, that count goes into the video as well and gets transmitted. We can see the number of dewirements. You can that's also see how good or bad the driver is from so, this, can yeah, you? Yeah, that. Yeah. Is there, and then you can, when you're doing an investigation, it's three things, right? The driver, you see a dunce, B, a particularly bad spot in the overhead, so you yeah. see it on other buses too, or D, oh, right. the actual problem on this bus. All oh, right, yeah. all the drivers have the same problem, it's not the yeah, driver. Of course, oh. Right. Oh. Yeah. So when the driver is deciding uh, when, when to turn and when not to, so they're going to either trip the, yeah, that's right. the system that's or right. not. Yeah. So coast this, is, this is right here. no power is being, no current is being Correct, dropped. here this is a power switch right okay, here. Wonderful, wonderful. So you have to press this forward every time. When you see an arrow saying power and you want to turn to the right and the arrow shows to the right, you hit that switch. Okay, power. and so what that means is it's drawing power? That's correct. Which trips the it's sensor. It's making sure it draws power, okay. correct. Yeah. Okay. Huh. Then this one makes sure this bus does not draw power. It still allows you enough current to, go, to drive slowly because when you totally cut off the power and you're on a slight hill and you have to go to the switch, you're not going to have any traction anymore. Yeah. yeah. Because you cut everything off, but you're going to move, so what are you going to do? You're going to right? stall otherwise. So it allows you still 40 amps. Oh. Okay. So you have no. So it re reduces the Correct. Rather than yeah. Totally. Okay. That's right. We just want to make sure we're a good distance away from the activation current for that switch, right? And how often is it a problem that uh, someone forgets to, to pull the switch and the circuit doesn't get tripped? Quite a bit of times. It's quite a bit. Oh, yeah, because that's got to work. Even down. the electric ones, if you don't curve yourself into position properly, you're too far out or too far in. Yeah. Then you have to stop and go out and manually switch it over. So you're on the right line. If you wanted to turn right and yeah, you forgot to do you that. You know what? We've had cases where, for example, you did everything right, but for some reason the, the two solenoids didn't really work nicely. One goes yeah. this way and the other pole stays over there. So we actually so you have, get one connector I staying actually on have it. seen poles. There's two separate lines. One stayed over there and one is over the other. And you could still drive. Mm. But the driver saw it because the poles are on this way, right? Yeah. <laughs> so they have to go back and yeah. put them out. So, yeah. The drivers, they have to keep an eye on many things. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We used to have a little dashboard indicator or a little indicator here which showed the angle of each pole. <laughs> and with different color schemes saying warning red right here no it's separated too yeah. much but for some reason it got shafted i would love to have just one switch that says uh on the line off the line and for everything else to be yeah the bus of because the future that would be sweet right during the time when they frowned upon anything distracting drivers right oh. they do not allow to have any more displays with watching things you're supposed to be watching traffic right yeah, yeah. yeah. But poles can still be kind of seen on a 40 footer because in a mirror view mirror you can still see your rope. And on this mirror you can oh, see. Oh, right. So, what you have, especially in the older buses we used to have it, they had a separate mirror where you look in and see at least from one side that yeah. the yeah. poles are still there, right? 
Nice. Okay. Oh, good. Wonderful. Thank you. System, we have a winter summer position, yep. which automatically detects temperature. Good. And anything below, let's say, six degrees or three degrees, assumes it's winter time and increases the distance of detection ah. to two meters instead of one meter. Allow more slack to like yeah. take yeah. into account that it might be ice yeah. or issues contact. Six feet, twelve feet. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually two, four meters. Yeah. Sorry, not one meter. Six feet, twelve feet. That's what it was. Okay. And so it just basically doubles the distance to account for ice. Yeah. Okay. There are attachments like in Seattle. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, these are small little sections, but the only section we have here where you can. Uh, no, normally, in the old days, we just had a trough up there with just this little bit of power, nothing else. This was just added off. Yeah. So there's a charging line that I feel like the when the bus is parked here they're moving the, the poles all the way over here to charge from that 600 volt line. Where to go? <laughs> Here he is. We lost him. <laughs> You're right about this guy. He has so much energy. It's wonderful. Yeah. And he knows everything. Oh, it's amazing. I see why so many people stay on here for so long. It's a Oh, nice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> nice. Can't resist. There's a whole bunch of like. Oh my god. Wonderful. Let me just go get closer. You never look at the drawing for Okay, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Hi. Hello. Spare parts. Ah, wonderful. Um, do you have that measuring tape on you? Yes, I do. Right here. I just want to. Try to navigate a donut at the same time. Mm hmm. So the wall thickness is half an inch, I think. Yeah, it looks like it. Yep. These are serious, serious conductors. The wrapping, the fiberglass wrapping is rather thin. It's not very thick. Just a millimeter. Mm-hmm. With the wrapping... Just enough to insulate and to keep it safe from the weather. And look, this is the... Those are the contacts. So those are brand mm -hmm. new ones. These are the shoes. And uh, the insert would just sit in here. And that's a travel direction going this way so the carbon is pushed in. Mm. Mm. What are they made of? Glass. That's nice. Um, can we see some of these inserts, these carbon? Yeah, carbon sure. I, I tried to should have brought one down, but yes, you definitely can see. Oh, no, no, no. So the brass things, they don't have to be exchanged every day, just the inserts that go in. Correct. Yeah. How long they do the brass things last? Um, what we have seen though in the past, the brass is not immune to wear and tear because especially the sides sometimes get hit, or here where there's overhead. Mm -hmm. And when a carbon breaks, sometimes it chaves right down into here. Mm -hmm. oh, right. But what they do, we have an in-house program, when this gets worn on the sides, they fill the sides back up. They heat it up and brace it back in. Oh, you can brace material back on, yeah. Correct, but I don't oh. know how many times they do it. I asked them actually just recently. It's an advantage of having them made of brass, so it's easier to... The only worry we have, when you work too much on these things and you heat them up too much, you could get warpage. That means when the carbon lies on top of it, you have a concavity, 
and it could break them in the middle now on the next impact. Yeah. So these cables, they make contact to make sure all the current doesn't have to travel correct, through here. Correct. In the old days, it used to go through here, but it's not very good because of the swivel sometimes fills with water and heavy rain, yeah. and then you have a contact issue. There is mm. still contact there though, right? So they yeah, are parallel, is, but yeah. the main power goes here, correct. If that cable were to rip, all the power would go through here. 180 it would, kilowatts. It would, That's a scary. It would arc inside and prohibit oh, it. It's, it becomes stiff yeah. and it no longer turns and you dewire all the time. Mm. So this can go that way correct. and it can swivel way, that way. And this way too, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a good amount of swivel. Like now, this is another part that I... You know, we don't want to mess with. That's a, that's a beautiful thing. And then on our geyser truck, it's a very unique system. We also incorporated a fluid supply into the middle. Oh, this is the, the other system. end of the pole. This is oh. what's held. Uh, there's an insulator, so it can go inside the metal sleeve that gets clamped. Out, that's correct. Yeah. So is it possible to lift the pole? And here's the power connection, see? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, can we lift the pole to just get yeah, an estimate on the... Uh, Let's see where they like get the hernia right away. Or not. The hernia? Well, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to stress myself out. It's light. It's fairly really light. Yeah. It's c considering the, the size of the thing and that there's a big aluminum rod in the middle. It's fairly light. What's, a, what's an estimate? Uh, 20 kilos? I was going to say 40 pounds. Yeah, 20 kilos. Yeah, 40 pounds is a good number. Okay. That is lighter than I thought. Yeah, it's surprisingly light. Shark fin. This one here had to be designed in such a way it didn't create a problem on dewirements. It used to be pointed the other way before in the past. Oh, but then it gets and caught in the And when the gets caught in the guy wires. Yeah. So whenever time you get caught, you have a travel direction to be deflected. Yikes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Very interesting. It's all the little details that have to be right. Oh, it's yeah. Built in traps otherwise. So the, the biggest, I'm thinking in terms of uh, problems that we want to solve. And the biggest one is reconnecting to the wires when there's a disconnect. Um, you know, secondarily there's, you know, trying to prevent dewiring from all sorts of reasons. But being able yeah. to come on and off more easily is the, is the big one. Yeah. Has there ever been a consideration to a side totally different topic uh, to prevent arcs from forming? Can a bus like that could it theoretically have an arc detecting a detecting system that would just turn off the current every time it jumps and before it starts drawing the real hard arc, well, it would just have, not allow to draw it current anymore. It would have to be very fast. Yeah, what we have in the buses right now is because we used to have a problem especially when you're losing the power right away and, and your, your systems are all still on and they're depleting the filter capacitor voltage down far enough mm. that the line contactor now opens up and that means now it's all jerky. And Don't. you're going on the battery. So now we have, in your regards, we have zero volt detection systems. Uh -huh. uh, each major component has one built in. That means if you're having zero volts, don't do the heater. Don't do the only thing allowed still is a little bit of traction. The traction goes to minimum. Mm -hmm. But do not have any other loads on there. Temporarily bring the loads down so you don't yeah. deplete the filter capacitor voltage. Mm -hmm. And that smooths that out significantly. Yeah. Oh, okay. right. yeah, the arc is always there when there is certain power flows because the zero voltage detection only relies on one thing. Yeah. Measuring voltage. Yeah. Yeah. What happens if you have a dirty insulator full of carbon and it conduct it has enough current? Your current transducer at the voltage transducer has a let's say a very high impedance. Yeah. It doesn't know that it's actually measuring through dirt. It's measuring voltage potential because it's so sensitive. Oh, and as nice. soon as the power comes on, it drops across that dirt or that uh, carbon, and you immediately drop down to zero. Now it's too late. Mm. You know did the damage. That's the big arc. And everything else goes off, including contactors. Yeah. The, the new transducers we are now installing have to have a shunt resistor in order 
to eliminate, you know, to high impedance readings and get a low impedance readings back saying, okay, that is truly no voltage or I'm not reading any faults behind the uh, dirt buildup type yeah. of voltage. Yeah, yeah. And could you use the poles, the poles at the shunts? The power poles, could they be used as shunts? No. There must be a voltage drop across the power pole. Oh, oh right. Uh, it's small though, because they're, they're big conductors. Tiny, yeah. 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 You know that uh, our voltage detection it's system is actually down at the other end of the pole. It's, 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 pole. it's never up there. So whatever you know is already down here. Mm -hmm. Right. You don't measure that. Mm -hmm. Right, because yeah. and, and you Another don't bus to could measure anymore. it, right? Yeah. You have two buses. What does he read versus what you read? What oh, yeah, yeah. You would get half half of uh, oh, what's yeah, on each bus. But you're, you're right, probably. I don't know, a little bit of difference, but you wouldn't know because you pick it up at the other end. And they would have to be calibrated for each pole. They're probably just enough of a difference because of manufacturing that you would have to calibrate yeah, to the very yeah, shunt yeah. that you get with the Carbon pole. Carbon contact, you know what I mean? Yeah. It wouldn't be a trivial problem. No, yeah. It would be hard. Okay, hey. Maybe the smart carbon. Yeah. If you all sit here, if you all start saying, hey, I'm all worn out, I need a break. That would be <laughs> ideal. The, the, the tricky part is always, you know, you want to get all this information about what's going on up here, but you don't want to have to run wires up this yeah, monstrous Yeah, conductor. basically everything is wireless nowadays, right? You want to go wireless, but then again, how much wireless can a system handle, right? Yeah, well, and especially, if it's, especially if it's right up there next to the 600 volt. Because any arcing up there, when you're having a radio transmitter oh, it'll or whatever, destroy whatever this is just like complete yeah. noise. Oh, yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah, yeah. Especially in a low band, you have a 15 kilohertz IGBT switching cycle, and whatever uh, harmonics you get on top of it, you can hear the snap crackle pop in your AM radio. Yeah. 15 kilohertz, okay. Yeah. But in your AM radio, it affects a 600, 700 kilohertz band, right? When you're driving right behind it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Not an FM, not so much. We do have okay, you know, nice circuits like one radio of the anymore. spools you saw, right? We have that throughout the bus. Mm. Combination of capacitors and conductors to cut down an EMI. But nothing's perfect. Yeah, this spark plug in the car is a radio transmitter. Yeah. Yeah. I sometimes drive beside a truck and I can't hear AM anymore because of spark plug wire. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Good. I think we have to I head out here. Okay. So you 945.